President Trump was able to get Israel to agree to have a, a two-state solution with the Palestinians, and for the first time in history, to agree to a map that outlined the territory uh, that they would be willing to, to work with in order to see that happen. Um, that showed a lot of people in the region that Israel was serious about really moving forward and making peace, and also showed them that President Trump's leadership and diplomacy could make things happen that hadn't happened previously. In this article, dated August 18th, we have Dear Jared, never, okay, never. This is an op-ed in which Jack Engelhard says in the subtitle, we need to know, Jared, who made this, quote, very generous proposal for the establishment of a Palestinian state, end quote. If the Abraham Accord is prophetically in conflict with the Abrahamic covenant, then we got a problem. I'm going to scroll down and the article is representative of, I believe, what a number of people are wondering right now but look at how it opens up that's all I needed to read from this dispatch to feel utterly betrayed now clicking right here we're gonna open that up in a separate tab the dispatch to which he is referring is right here Jared Kushner the first time Israel has agreed to a map of a Palestinian state this is what he's referring to right here. Okay, let's go back over to the article. That's all I needed to read from this dispatch to feel utterly betrayed. This article was posted on August 14th. Scrolling down it references some tweets. Two tweets cooled down the celebrations in Jerusalem Thursday night. One was from Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed of the United Arab Emirates, who declared, In my phone call today with U.S. President Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, it was agreed to stop Israel's annexation of the Palestinian territories. Now, there's the tweet in Arabic. Do you understand how serious this is? Scrolling down a little further, we have a tweet from the White House. President at Real Donald Trump was able to get Israel to agree to a two-state solution with the Palestinian people and, for the first time in history, agree to a map that outlined the territory. Addressing Israeli reporters, Kushner said that Israel has made a very generous proposal for the establishment of a Palestinian state, including an exchange of territories. The understanding that this is the situation has enabled the breakthrough that led to the current agreement. First of all, and most of all, Israel belongs to Israel and no one else, period. No one, not even a president nor a prime minister, has the right to divide the land. Land which is God-given and which has been paid for in rivers of Jewish blood. 2 Samuel chapters 8 through 11. King David was recognized as a man after God's own heart because he would do all of God's will. When the prophet Samuel was rebuking Saul for not doing the will of God, notice what the prophet Samuel told Saul. You know, the Lord's found someone who's going to do his will. David is referred to in the scriptures as a man after God's own heart. Why? The Bible tells us. Concerning the land of Israel, David took full possession of all of the land that the Lord promised to Abram. 
Let's take a look at that now. The word refers to David as a man after God's own heart because he would do all of God's will. Now watch this. What was accomplished by King David during his reign? You see right here the river of Egypt. That is one of the things that the Lord mentioned in Genesis chapter 15 as the lower boundary of the promised land. When you read your Bible from chapters 8 through 11 of 2 Samuel, these are the locations that came under David's control. David was not perfect. Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, King David included. But he did do something in particular that was prophetically revealed that he would do, and that was he fulfilled God's promise in terms of the land of Israel. Specifically, David did do all of God's will with respect to the promise that the Lord made to Abram. We have up here a reference to the Euphrates. As you can see right here, this is the Euphrates River, and this is the upper boundary of the promised land as described in Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, when we see the Lord's covenant that he made with Abram, whose name was later changed to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant is basically a land covenant. And the Lord revealed to Abram that the land that he was going to give to him and his descendants, a land covenant which is reaffirmed in Psalm 105, verses 7 through 11 with Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, would be comprised of the land from the river of Egypt, which we know as the Nile, all the way up to the river Euphrates. If you do a study on the land that David took possession of during his reign, it was none other than the land from the Nile all the way up to the Euphrates. Chapter 15. After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shalt not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with their great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold a smoking furnace, and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt, unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, and the Kenizzites, and the Kadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. In that sense, we have very specifically demarcated by borders that the Lord specified and promised to Abram, we have a king of Israel who took possession of all the land that God promised to Abram and reaffirmed to Isaac and Jacob. Now, why is this important? What is so important about this is that it reveals exactly why David was a man after God's own heart. 
the scriptures say that he would do all of God's will. And with respect to the promise that the Lord made to Abram, that covenant which is known as the Abrahamic covenant, a covenant which is described in Psalm 105 as an everlasting covenant, a covenant which if I have said it before, I'm going to say it again just because people... They need a little help making a connection. It's a land covenant. Okay? It's a land covenant. Now, the land of Israel is back in the news. It is back in the news. Now, King David is recognized in the scripture as a man after God's own heart. Because among various reasons, we know for sure that he did all of God's will with respect to taking possession of all of the land of Israel, which kept God's promise to Abram. Let's go ahead and take a look at Psalm 105. In particular, I'm going to focus in on verses 7 through 11. It says in Psalm 105, verse 7 and following, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. People don't realize, but a lot of the things that we see happening, while not necessarily the wrath of God, the Lord's judgments are in all the earth. I'm going to make some book recommendations, one in particular that documents how time and time again, when certain things are stated or done against Israeli sovereignty over Israeli land, there is a pattern of consequences that is more consistent than most people could even possibly imagine. Territorial concessions that were made in the past were terrible mistakes. Israel is still paying a dreadful price for Ariel Sharon's quote, generosity. The sin of giving up Gaza. Verse 8, he remembers his covenant forever. Okay, pay close attention. The word which he commanded. Okay, hold on. That word commanded, if we tie it back to what we just heard in 1 Samuel chapter 12, remember verse 15 is extremely significant. We're going to be getting very specific here. We need to know, Jared, who made this, quote, very generous proposal for the establishment of a Palestinian state. End quote. This would be anathema to both the United States and Israel. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations. Okay, well, what word is that? Let's go ahead and continue reading because the scriptures will answer the questions that they prompt. Let's continue. Psalm 105, verse 9, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. Okay, now it's getting very specific. Okay, what is this covenant that the Lord made with Abraham, which is a commandment for a thousand generations? In other words, a covenant that he remembers forever. And this is right there in Psalm 105, verse 8. We've got to connect what the Word of God is revealing, in some cases, with the previous verse. Just, again, the, the Word of God will answer the questions that it prompts in your mind. Now, let's take a look. In Verse 9, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. 
in verse 10, it gets even more specific. Psalm 105 verse 10 says, and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute. What's another word for a statute? A law, okay? A commandment, a law. To Israel as an everlasting covenant. Now this is so important because as specifically as these verses have been pointing to the Abrahamic covenant, it is going to pin it down for us in verse 11. Watch what happens. Saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. You see, the Lord refers to the land as the inheritance, Israel's inheritance. In light of the verses that we have read together in these uh, different passages of Scripture, that sentence right there in Jack Englehart's op-ed, when I saw it, I, uh, I thought immediately of the pattern of consequences that has been documented in Eye to Eye, William Koenig's book. Now the scriptures say that the Lord puts his word even above his name, because somebody said that your name is only as good as your word. Think about that for a moment. And if anyone is going to make sure that their name is intact, it is the Lord God. And he made a promise to Abram, which has been repeatedly challenged. And the consequences, I think about a White House press correspondent who has documented in a book entitled Eye to Eye, facing the consequences of dividing the land of Israel, William Koenig, a White House press correspondent of, what, some 20 years now has documented how whenever, I'm going to go ahead and say it, whenever United States presidents have pressured Israel to give up any part of their land in exchange for peace. I see these different posts, you know, right now, I'm seeing this again. People are saying, if you have anything negative to say about this, then unfriend me now. Now, I'm not going to necessarily respond to a post like that because I want to extend a lot of room, a lot of grace, because people are operating out of loyalties and patriotism and so forth. And I understand that. It's a very powerful love and it's a love I understand. But we need to factor in the fear of the Lord. We need to factor in what his expressed will is. And if repeatedly, whenever Israel has been pressured to give up any part of their land, or in the case of when the Jews were taken from their homes in Gaza, and Gaza was forsaken, and the Bible prophesies this in Zephaniah, but when Gaza was forsaken and Jews were taken from their homes in Gaza, and Gaza was forsaken, it was given up, and it's referred to historically as the Gaza expulsion, then what happened was, you know, in the case of the Gaza expulsion, it was Hurricane Katrina. And then repeatedly, over and over again, if you read Eye to Eye, William Koenig's book, in which the subtitle is Facing the Consequences of Dividing the Land of Israel, I don't care how you dress it up. I'm not trying to antagonize. I'm just saying the Bible reveals in Joel chapter 3, verse 2, that one of the reasons why God is going to judge the nations, one of the reasons why he's going to gather the nations for judgment is because they did this to my people, they did that to my people, they did this this, this, that, and the other, and they even divided my land. When the Lord made that covenant with Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham, when the Lord made that covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18, he was making that covenant with Israel in mind. Reading on, if it was Benjamin Netanyahu, then we've been misled. 
misled to believe in the Prime Minister's own words. Yesterday, he said that the UAE peace arrangement signals, quote, signals the end to land for peace, end quote. Sounds good. But something must have happened between yesterday and today. Today, Jared, you tell us something quite the opposite. I quote, the understanding that this is the situation has enabled the breakthrough that led to the current agreement. In other words, to achieve peace with the UAE, Israel first had to agree to an exchange of territories for the establishment of a Palestinian state. And he has those phrases in quotes, quote, an exchange of territories, end quote, for, quote, the establishment of a Palestinian state, end quote. Sounds like land for peace to me. Seems like there's been a trade-off after all. Sounds like there has been arm twisting and that someone cried uncle. Netanyahu? Prime Minister Netanyahu agreed to this? President Trump agreed to this? Or is this your own deal of the century, part one? Many of us fear what could come next. We have in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, Then he, that is the Lord, said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Clearly, this is talking about Israel when they were in Egypt. Verse 14 goes on to be even more specific. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. That is exactly what happened in the Exodus. The children of Israel left Egypt with great possessions. So you see how it's describing the children of Israel before Israel was even born. But what that does is it reveals that the Lord was thinking of Israel when he made this promise to Abram in verse 18. I made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. I will establish my covenant with Isaac for an everlasting covenant, and with his descendants after him. I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people, and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. For I will take you from among the nations, and gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. And they shall not sell or exchange any of it. They may not alienate the best part of the land, for it is holy to the Lord. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. No world leader has the right to divide the covenant land of Israel. Those who attempt to will face significant consequences. And let us hope that this conference of Madrid will mark the beginning of a new chapter in the history of the Middle East. إن سوريا تسعى إلى السلام العادل والشامل مع إسرائيل كخيار استراتيجي My vision is two states living side by side in peace and security. Again, I applaud Prime Minister Sharon for making a, a decision that uh, has really 
changed the dynamics on the ground and it really provided hope for the Palestinian people. I said that the United States believes that negotiations should result in two states with permanent Palestinian borders with Israel, Jordan, and Egypt. The only way for Israel to endure and thrive as a Jewish and democratic state is through the realization of an independent and viable Palestine. The president is very committed to uh, achieving a solution here that will be able to bring prosperity and peace to all people in this area. It's a great honor to be with the King of Jordan. Hurricane Maria, it blasted Puerto Rico today with sustained winds of 155 miles an hour. The watchman shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. They, the watchmen, shall see an exact agreement between the prophecy and the event, the promise and the performance. They shall see how they look one upon another eye to eye and be satisfied that the same God spoke the one and did the other. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. This is the everlasting covenant, saying to your descendants, I have given this land. Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound like Psalm 105 verse 11? To your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. It all ties together. As if Israel is simply another parcel of real estate. No, Israel is holy land and only because of the Jews going back to when Moses led the Hebrews to this good earth. Surely Netanyahu knows this, knows that never again shall Israel give up an inch of Jewish territory. We need this assurance unequivocally. Consider it a battle cry. Now that from Jack Englehart, a New York-based best-selling American novelist who writes regularly for Arutz Sheva. We are fast approaching a juncture in which decisions will be made with regard to the land of Israel. Even now, the question as to whether Israel is going to go with sovereignty and annexing Judea and Samaria, land which is entirely within the boundaries of the land of Israel as the Lord sees it. Remember, he sees the land of Israel in terms of what he promised to Abraham and he describes it as an everlasting covenant. He describes it as something that is a statute, a commandment. So now we are approaching with these different things that are in the headlines with increasing frequency. Questions that pertain to the land of Israel and whether or not Israel will be allowed to annex land which is, once again, within the boundaries that the Lord said was their inheritance. Do you see how serious this is? If the Bible and what the Lord has revealed in His Word is for you what it was for King David, then you're somebody after God's own heart. Amen? If that's important to you, if you, if, if you tremble at His Word, if it is the start and end point of all discussion, if it is the foundation and the framework, 
then you'll understand that anything that causes or pressures Israel to share, gift, give up, surrender, I don't care how you want to say it, and I don't care who it is that's doing it. You know, the prophet Samuel presented Saul to Israel with the highest hopes. He presented King Saul to Israel with the highest hopes. You might say that he even voted for King Saul. He's a head taller than everyone else. And he says, look, Israel, here's your king. You asked for a king, here he is. Head taller than everybody else. <sighs> Vote of confidence from the prophet of God. But things didn't remain that way between Samuel and Saul because eventually there was a vote of no confidence. Why? Because Saul did not do the will of God. He compromised. He compromised. So the prophet Samuel says, you know what? If you had done the will of God, then your kingdom would have endured. But no, no. The Lord has chosen somebody else who will do all his will. Now, King David didn't do everything right. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But one thing that King David did during his reign is he delivered on the Lord's promise to Abram. He delivered on a very important promise that God made to Abram, and that was a land covenant, an everlasting covenant, in which the land that the Lord promised to Abram would have as its borders the Nile to the Euphrates. That, documentably, is at least one reason why King David was a man after God's own heart, because as the scripture says, he would do all of God's will. What really is the price that Israel pays for this peace agreement? It's a question that is raised by a Yamina MK in the scrolling text block, and that is an article, What is the price we paid for normalizing ties? If we click to read more, we have an article which addresses that question. Yamina MK, what is the price we paid for normalizing ties? MK Ophir Sofer demands to know what price Israel paid in the agreement with the United Arab Emirates. Over at Koenig World Watch Daily, watch.org, we see among the headlines some that are relevant to that question. And among them, we have, for example, reported deal to sell UAE F-35 jets edges in on U.S. promise of Israeli dominance. Scrolling down, there was a preceding report which came out first, and that was Defense Minister, it's not good for Israel if other countries get the F-35. Just trying to keep up with these headlines, here's another one. Report, Trump admin pushing for F-35 sale to UAE. Normalization, but at what price? This particular article, as we can see right here, Report, Trump administration pushing for sale of F-35s to UAE. U.S. officials, Trump administration has accelerated a push to sell the F-35 stealth fighter and advanced armed drones to UAE. Well, there you have an F-35 stealth fighter. The Trump administration has accelerated a push to sell the F-35 stealth fighter and advanced armed drones to the United Arab Emirates. American officials familiar with the discussions told the New York Times on Wednesday. Administration officials in recent weeks gave a classified briefing about the F-35 to the Emirati military despite some concerns among National Security Council staff about the wisdom of disclosing details on one of the Pentagon's most advanced weapons to a foreign government before a decision about a potential arms sale has been completed, according to the report. Greenblatt, sovereignty is not a question of if, but of when, Trump's former envoy. 
agreement with the UAE was a right move by Netanyahu. There is hope for progress with other Arab neighbors as well. Let's check the logic on this because with respect to what Israel is being pressured to do first is to allocate land for a Palestinian state. And only after allocating land for a Palestinian state does sovereignty become an available option. The problem with that is, you know, when we look at these maps, and it's consistently the same map for the Trump peace plan, we've got that vision of peace, state of Israel, and you can click to enlarge that. But what you have right here in the green area is the new Palestine or the future Palestinian state that is being proposed and pushed onto Israel. And, you know, there are among the different people who are speaking out regarding this, uh, some very wise and cautionary uh, admonitions that if you let this happen, how do you declare sovereignty? I'm at MiddleEastEye.net right now. How do you declare sovereignty or annex the land after it has, for all intents and purposes, been given away, at least in part, for the formation of a future Palestinian state? So once again, the logic breaks down. And so here we have the article on Middle East Eye where you can find this map and we can just go from one news source to the next. You've got Vox and if you scroll down you have this same map. Everybody's got the same map on their site with respect to this peace plan. Let's go over to Jerusalem Post. This peace plan comes with a map. Why is this significant? Well, if we scroll down once again, it's that same map again, and there's the article on Jerusalem Post. On Haaretz, you've got an article, What Israel and Palestine Will Look Like According to Trump's Peace Plan, full text. Again, you've got that same map, you've got a podcast, you've got the main points that this would entail. Jewish Telegraph Agency, same map, okay? And scrolling down, it goes into details about these maps. But the reason why I'm going from one major news source to another is to silence any voices that would say, well, that's not really the official map. Well, <laughs> you've got one agency after another, including both Arab and Jewish news agencies, saying that this is the map. So... Don't even go there. Tapping this up a little bit more, you've got Trump's plan for a failed Palestinian state at jewishnews.com. If we scroll down, is it the same map? Well, there it is. It's the same map. When you hear about different ones referring to the peace plan that was presented in January, remember that is the peace to prosperity peace plan that was posted at the White House website and when you scroll down you have the political framework and the economic framework but what we're gonna do is just tab over to the actual PDF document incidentally you can download this PDF document by clicking where it says download the full plan so let's go ahead and take a look at this right here I'm just gonna do one thing with respect to what we're going to look for in this and we're just going to go ahead and type in a little search Palestinian state hit enter and then what happens is you've got multiple references to a Palestinian state in this document it's counting it's still counting numbers increasing 200 300 346 so you have 346 references you might be able to see them highlighted right there but 346 references 
to a Palestinian state. Okay, so you just saw the maps and the number of references to a Palestinian state in this plan are extensive. Okay, so over 300 references to a Palestinian state. If that is the priority that this peace plan has placed on the formation of a Palestinian state, and if this is what the Palestinian state would look like, then how is sovereignty a question of when? How does sovereignty remain an option for Israel over their own land, over all of their own land, if this happens? Stories are coming in so fast it's hard to keep up with them, but Reuters reports Saudi price for ties with Israel is Palestinian state from a Saudi royal. Scrolling down, we have Dubai, Reuters. Saudi Arabia's price for normalizing relations with Israel is the creation of a sovereign Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital. Do you understand why the demand for Israel, the weight on sovereignty, is a mistake? This is another reason why waiting on sovereignty would be an error. A Palestinian state in the land of Israel with Jerusalem as its capital and yet this is being hailed as historic. There's the article. Within the article we have Israel will suspend declaring sovereignty over areas outlined in the president's vision for peace and focus its efforts now on expanding ties with other countries in the Arab and Muslim world. And who is Israel repeatedly looking to in terms of Israel's leadership? Who is Israel's leadership repeatedly referring to in terms of whether or not they have the go-ahead, the green light, the permission? Prime Minister vows to implement sovereignty plan with U.S. approval. Life in America before and after the Trump Peace to Prosperity Plan was delivered on January 28th, 2020 by William Koenig. Go to watch.org to find this and related stories. God's will is clearly revealed in the promise that he made to Abram, the Abrahamic covenant. It is so ironic to me that this agreement that is being hailed as historic and it's being couched in such oh, feel-good terms, you know, if it goes in the direction of Israel having to give up any part of its land. While we're hearing so much about peace and security and peace and security, read First Thessalonians chapter 5 because it has some things to say about peace and security in First Thessalonians chapter 5. And it's in First Thessalonians chapter 5 that the Bible is describing or at least referring to the day of the Lord. And it's going to be while certain ones are saying peace and safety, peace and security. But thankfully, before 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 reveals some things that the Bible says in chapter 4, verse 18 in particular. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. <sighs> There are some words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 which should comfort us, which should encourage us, because sequentially 4 comes before 5, and I believe that there's a very significant reason why that which is revealed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is described prior to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But even in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, pay attention to the pronouns because the Word of God is referring to, on the one hand, they and them, and then on the other hand, but you brethren. And they and them, but on the other hand, but you brethren. 
follow the pronouns and realize that you're not supposed to be among the they and the them. You're supposed to experience that which is described regarding but you, brethren. On JewishPress.com, Shaked to Netanyahu, show us your map of Palestine. This article is actually from today. And scrolling down, we have here Ayelet Shaked at a press conference. This photo is from September 15th of 2019. Um, I'm going to scroll down a little bit further here, tap down the size of the text, and uh, we'll just scroll down and read this together. Former Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked of the Yamina Party slammed Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of the Likud Party for doing what she insisted even former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert and in fact, no other past Prime Minister of Israel has ever done to agree to a map. Now, what she is referring to, of course, is a map of Palestine, a two-state solution variety. So we have her tweet on Twitter of this particular video, which we'll take a look at. Uh, it, let's see if I can play it right here inside of the article. We'll play it from right here on Twitter. Let me get the volume turned on. Palestinian state and also to, so President Trump was able to get Israel to agree to a Palestinian state and also to agree uh, to a map. Now Muslims throughout the world can fly to Dubai and Abu Dhabi, go to Tel Aviv, and they can pray at the mosque. They've suspended uh, any efforts to apply Israeli sovereignty to areas of the West Bank. That is what she is referring to. Scrolling down a little further, Shaked appeared outraged in response to an announcement by White House senior advisor Jared Kushner, who told reporters when speaking about last week's announcement of the historic, again they're referring to this in uh, glowing terms, historic peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Isaiah chapter 24 describes impending judgment on the earth but it does not just describe the judgment it also provides the reason why the judgment is coming behold the lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants the land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered for the lord has spoken this word the earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. Verse 5. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. We begin to ask, what is the cause of all of this happening? The word because indicates that the answer is forthcoming because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. I've got to breadcrumb some of this, but I just wanted to mention that with respect to the patterns that have through prior years been so consistent, you need look no further than William Koenig's book, Eye to Eye, but you don't have to read 500 pages to understand what the Lord has to say about the land of Israel. It is His land. And while we can document consequences for whenever we've pressured Israel to give up any part of their land, that's documentable in terms of the consistency of the pattern. But even if we set that aside just for a moment and just look at what the Bible has to say, what the Lord has to say about the land that He promised to Israel, He is very serious about that. That Abrahamic covenant, again, to me it's ironic that this peace plan has been presented as the Abraham Accord. But once again, if the Abraham Accord is prophetically in conflict with the Abrahamic covenant, then we got a problem. And I quote, President Trump was able to get Israel to agree to a Palestinian state and also agree to a map of the borders of the state of Palestine. 
Chakhed demanded the Prime Minister reveal the map of Palestine he allegedly agreed to. Now, again, if that map is anything like what we have seen as the Vision for Peace conceptual map for a future state of Palestine, then obviously that would be what she's concerned about. And scrolling down a little further, uh, what we have here is a video that actually captures her response. I'm going to see if I can play it right in here. President Trump was able to get Israel to agree to a Palestinian state and also to agree uh, to a map. In light of what we have seen regarding the everlasting covenant, what the Bible has to say about it, and how it is specifically about the land of Israel. A headline like this should be alarming. But this is what we're seeing. Kushner and Ben Zayed. Verse 5. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. We have already established what the everlasting covenant is. And David wrote about this in Psalm 105. David, once again, being a man after God's own heart, because as the scripture describes him, he would be a man who would do all of God's will. And David did all of God's will with respect to the land that the Lord promised to Abraham. Do you begin to appreciate how serious this truly is? Verse 6 goes on to say, Therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. That which is described in verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 24 is tied to that which is presented in verse 5. The cause of this happening is specifically tied to the breaking of the everlasting covenant. This article was posted just a few days ago on August 14th. Scrolling down, it references some tweets Two tweets cooled down the celebrations in Jerusalem Thursday night. One was from Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed of the United Arab Emirates, who declared, In my phone call today with U.S. President Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, it was agreed to stop Israel's annexation of the Palestinian territories. There's the tweet in Arabic. Do you understand how serious this is? Scrolling down a little further, we have a tweet from the White House. President at Real Donald Trump was able to get Israel to agree to a two-state solution with the Palestinian people. Themes and current events are resembling themes in Bible prophecy. Things are lining up in such a way that you almost have to pay somebody to help you misunderstand it. And there are a lot of people who should know better, who are rationalizing and doing all kinds of mental gymnastics. And it's, it sometimes is painful to watch. I mean, we want to give the benefit of the doubt, but sometimes we see these mental gymnastics that are like, you guys remember Yogi Kudu and how he would just bend around and, and fit himself in a little box. I know I'm dating myself because it's a long time ago, but sometimes we see these gymnastics 
these intellectual, and in some cases intellectually dishonest, gymnastics where people contort their logic in order to fit or maintain a misplaced loyalty. Remember the prophet Samuel, when he presented Saul to Israel, it was with full support. But when Saul went against God's will, things changed. And part of having discernment is recognizing when things change. And sometimes things change in such a way that we have to reevaluate what may now be a misplaced loyalty. Because our first loyalty needs to be to God and His Word. And if the direction where things are going starts moving away from God's Word and His will, then there might be a problem there. There are a lot of analogies that have been made from the standpoint of trains. And you know, on railroad tracks, there are these points where if the train tracks are switched by just a little lever, if you know, you switch the tracks, just the tracks will move, but that's all it has to do is just, you know, you pull that lever, and if the tracks move just so much, it's gonna change the course of the train. And we need to understand that if the tracks get switched, we need to stay with God and His Word. Because if things start going in a different direction, then we might have to let some things go. And that's really difficult. That can be very difficult because we need to hold on to what the Lord has revealed in His Word about some things which a lot of people are going to rationalize. People who know better, they're going to rationalize it and go through all kinds of mental gymnastics and contortions. And again, sometimes it's painful to watch it because they should know better. But they want so much to hold on to. Yeah, but we've got to recognize, we got to recognize when things change. Very few truly understand what is at stake. But we have right here, revealed in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 24, the cause of this curse that will devour the earth. What kind of curse would devour the earth such that Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. What kind of curse is that? It's hinged upon that last phrase in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 5. Other chapters related to the discussion include Genesis chapter 12, the same promises reaffirmed over and over again. Genesis chapter 13, Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 17. Once again, this covenant, this land covenant, this everlasting covenant, which is also a commandment, is reaffirmed again and again and again in these chapters. Samaria Regional Council Chairman calls on Prime Minister to announce that he has not given up on sovereignty in exchange for UAE deal. The article by Yassi Dagan says as follows, if Benjamin Netanyahu sells sovereignty in exchange for a piece of paper from a country that has never threatened Israel, this is not the deal of the century, this is the deception of the century. If Netanyahu tries to sell air to the public, he will get air back from the public. The Prime Minister has been elected three times in the past year on the basis of a platform of implementing sovereignty. This is the only argument he had in the face of the left's arguments that he is unfit to lead because of his legal situation. If Netanyahu sells Judea and Samaria in exchange for air, he is cutting off the political branch on which he sits and the continuation of his rule. I call on the Prime Minister and I beg him to make it clear with his voice that this is not true, that this is a spin and he is not giving up sovereignty because the public 
in the state of Israel elected him for it. There is a limit to cynicism. With all due respect to Jared Kushner's intrigues in Washington, our Prime Minister is Netanyahu. I call on Netanyahu to make it clear that this is not true. There is nothing that threatens the rule of the Prime Minister more than turning sovereignty into a scam of the century. Again, that is Yossi Dagan. And he is the chairman of the Sumerian Regional Council. So if you want to know how they feel in Judea and Samaria, there it is. Prime Minister vows to implement sovereignty plan with U.S. approval. See, everything is always hinging on with U.S. approval. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pushed back on the right-wing criticism Sunday that he has abandoned his plans to apply Israeli sovereignty over parts of Judea and Samaria in exchange for the Abrahamic Accords peace deal with the United Arab Emirates. Speaking with Galei Sahal Sunday afternoon, Netanyahu said that his sovereignty plan remained on the agenda and that its suspension is only temporary. Sovereignty hasn't been taken off the agenda. After all, I was the one who had it included in the Trump peace plan with American agreement. We will apply sovereignty with U.S. approval. It's not that I had a choice of either applying sovereignty or peace with the United Arab Emirates right now. They, the U.S., requested a suspension in the application of sovereignty, but they haven't taken it out of their peace plan. I believe he's referring to the peace to prosperity that was announced on January 28th. Netanyahu continues, From day one, I said that we would only do this with U.S. support. We must apply sovereignty over all settlements, is the headline of this article. Likud M.K. Karen Barak tours Samaria, says Israel faces unique and historic opportunity to apply sovereignty in Judea and Samaria. M.K. Karen Barak of the Likud party toured Samaria Thursday together with Samarian Regional Council Chairman Yossi Dagan. During the tour, Barak said that she found a home in Samaria and that the region is an important part of the country that must continue to grow and develop. I want to make an unequivocal and clear statement. We must apply sovereignty to all localities here. And this is a unique and historic opportunity, Barak said, noting that she believes the state of Israel should say no to the establishment of a Palestinian state. Barak stressed that the state of Israel must be determined in its dealings with the Trump administration and present a clear line of support for the application of sovereignty. We need to be determined and accountable to the U.S. administration, but now, not in a few months. Today, it is our time to lead in this matter. The Knesset is ready for it. The coalition is well. But the opposition will also be with us in this story. We must not miss it. Council Chairman Yossi Dagan responded to Barak's remarks and said, The Prime Minister must make a decision himself, as Begin made a decision on the Golan Heights and applied sovereignty in one day. And as the leaders of the left, for example, Levi Eshkol, who applied sovereignty over liberated eastern Jerusalem, and even Ben-Gurion, who applied sovereignty over West Jerusalem, even though most of the world does not accept it. Dagan said the Prime Minister should stand up to President Trump and tell him, you are a friend of the people of Israel, but you need to understand that we have needs. Dagan noted that the application of sovereignty is the historic test of the Prime Minister, perhaps the biggest test he has to face 
since he was elected. It is not only Likud voters who voted in favor of the application of sovereignty, but all citizens of the country. We have here at the top of chapter 11 something very important that the Apostle Paul conveys. He writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Let's take some time to read this right here. The Apostle Paul writes, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you will not be conceited. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. What we have here is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice what the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, beginning in verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Let's take a look at the harmony of the Gospels and why the Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually each contain the three components that comprise the gospel message. Number one, do they include the death of Christ? Well, we have that right here, the death of Christ, and in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's accounted for. How about the burial? The burial of Christ is accounted for in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How about the resurrection? The resurrection is also accounted for in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So as you can see, what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John account for over a couple of chapters, generally. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 accounts for over a couple of verses. So you can see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and verse 4, the three components that comprise the good news or the gospel message is that which the Apostle Paul taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, consistent and harmonious with that which we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Absolutely. So what we have right here, very clearly presented, is the gospel message. It's comprised of three key points. That is, once again, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel message. Repentance and confession are in response to the gospel message. What we have here clearly presented once again is the gospel but what is the response we find in Romans also written by the Apostle Paul something very interesting with respect to confession the role and importance of confession Romans chapter 10 verse 9 if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, 
resulting in salvation. Continuing in verse 11, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. Verse 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Another word that people will often discuss with respect to its position in regards to the gospel message is the word repentance. And repentance is by definition a deep sorrow, compunction, or contrition for a past sin, wrongdoing, or the like. Second definition is regret for any past action. Now what I'm going to do with respect to this word is look for what the Apostle Paul may have said in regards to repentance. And what we find in Acts chapter 26 verse 19, So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. So you see the Apostle Paul using both the words repent and repentance in relation to the Gentiles, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And when he wrote in Romans chapter 10, notice what we have right here in verse 12, just referring back to what we just read moments ago. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. The reason why I point this out is because the word repentance and the word repent are both used by the Apostle Paul in reference to his ministry to the Gentiles. This is certainly consistent with what the Lord Jesus Christ himself said with respect to repentance. Notice in Luke chapter 13, he says twice, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. That's Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Scrolling down a little further, what we find in the same passage, Luke chapter 13, verse 5, just a couple of verses later, as if for double emphasis, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. So repentance definitely has its place, and not just in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but that which the Apostle Paul received and delivered as well. So repentance and confession really are about that response to the gospel message. Okay, so you have the gospel message, and then there is your response to the gospel message. While we're in the gospel according to Luke, let's go ahead and read in chapter 23, verses 38 through 41, because I believe that a careful observation reveals that there is both repentance and confession. Notice what happens in verse 41. And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Is that not repentance? What the thief on the cross said in these words right here is a clear depiction of repentance. If we need to go back to the dictionary definition, deep sorrow, compunction, or contrition for past sin, wrongdoing, or the like. Regret for any past action. Clearly, that is expressed in verse 41. Let's read it again. And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. 
but this man has done nothing wrong. And watch in verse 42. Observe closely and you will see a confession. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What the thief on the cross communicates in verse 42 is clearly a confession because he is acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So what is the Lord's response in verse 43? And he said to him, truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. So you see in that interaction between the Lord Jesus Christ and the thief who obviously by his words repented and confessed, you see the Lord's response to him. You see, repentance and confession are about your response to the gospel message. Okay, The gospel message, once again, let's refer back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Duly acknowledging this, the Apostle Paul says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That is the good news. That is the gospel message. Sometimes I see brothers and sisters in the Lord getting at each other over the response to the gospel message. But clearly, repentance and confession, even for the thief on the cross, was part of the response. It's also interesting to note in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, where we find the letters to the seven churches, that the word repent is used on multiple occasions. In particular, I'm going to go to chapter 3 and scroll down to verse 19, and there's something very important that we want to notice right here. The Lord Jesus says right here, As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be zealous and repent. 